Hello and welcome, independent researchers, skeptics, and all of humankind, shadow citizens. Welcome to episode two. This week's guest is James, James Perloff, and you are listening to Shadow Citizen. We can be heard live, and you can chat with us at Mixler, M-I-X-L-R dot com slash forward Shadow Citizen. We are also simulcast, and you can hear several replays during the week at radioconfluence.com. And from there, you can take us with you on TuneIn and Xeno Live. So that's very, very cool. Anyway, our, uh, our main web- website is shadowcitizen.online, and we have our lineup of guests there. My name is Rob O'Sell, and my co-host is... Rachel L. McIntosh. And I'm so excited about this show because we have one of my very good friends, James Perloff, with us today. James, you here with us? Oh, definitely here. Yeah. Y- yay! Okay, this is great. James and I became friends... Um, Back in the day when I was sort of becoming aware that something was going on in the world that was different than the reality that I was living in, I was a defense contractor at that point. And I had heard him speak at some, it was some hotel in Massachusetts, and it was some sort of like a conference room at this hotel, and I was blown away by everything that he was telling us about. And so I went up to him afterwards, and I said, would you mind if we get together and have some coffee or tea or something and I invited myself to his house and I think he was completely flabbergasted that I showed up and we ended up talking and that was the beginning of me becoming aware that there was more to what was going on than what I had been taught in school and I am so glad you're here with us James I'm so proud of you and everything that you've done and I want people to know about um your really impressive book, Shadow Citizen, not Shadow Citizen, <laughs> Shadows of Power. And it's, um, you've also written another book about Tornado in a Junkyard, which is about evolution. And uh, your work about Shadows of Power got made into a film. And I want you to tell us all about this stuff. Where do you want to start, James? You talk because you are an expert. Go. Okay. Well, first, of all, I was only flabbergasted because I figured that uh, you were CIA and you had, you know, a gun and a knife and a poison dart in your purse. But fortunately, that didn't turn out to be the case. <laughs> but, um, yeah, okay. For me, uh, I guess Truth Movement goes back to 1978 when I saw a girl holding a book by Gary Allen called None Dare Call a Conspiracy. And I had uh, one of the experiences that I only have once every 10 years. You know, I don't have any special messages that I get from God normally, but there was something that told me I had to read this book. And uh, I went to a local Boston bookstore, and sure enough, they had it on the shelf. And that book, Men Dare Call a Conspiracy by Gary Allen, really opened my eyes for the first time to the fact that history has a pattern and uh, that governments have an, a force behind them with an agenda. Uh, that book talked about the Council on Foreign Relations, the, uh, the Lusitania false flag, it talked about the Federal Reserve and the drive for world government. And that got me really interested. And I found out that the John Birch Society was uh, one of the groups leading the fight against that. I'd so happen I lived a couple towns over from the John Birch Society, who were then headquartered in Belmont, Massachusetts. And so I got involved with them and I was introduced to their editor, Gary Benoit. I uh, started writing for their magazine, The New American, in 1985. And in 1988, I was assigned to uh, write a article on the Council on Foreign Relations, which, of course, is what the shadow oligarchy of America, that's their organization they use to control our presidential cabinets and direct our, our foreign and even our domestic policies. And the article became so long, it was going to overflow the page limits of the magazine. So the editor, Buck Mann, said, let's turn this into a book. It did turn out to be a bestseller for, th- for them. And um, in the mid, mid-90s, I got uh, very interested in uh, the whole creation evolution debate. I'd become a Christian in the 80s, but I still had these held over questions about how man got here. 
and I found that Darwin's theory of evolution was a house of cards. And I started uh, researching it, um, did a lot of PowerPoint talks on it eventually, but wrote two books, Tornado in a Junkyard is the big one, The Case Against Darwin is a short one. And in the summer of 2001, I, you know, I was on radio about twice a week. The, these books were getting pretty uh, well known. But of course, you know what happened on September the 11th, and I knew uh, once that occurred that no one was going to invite me on to talk about creation versus evolution, and for a very good reason. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that point, I realized that the, uh, well, I should say, uh, after I learned the truth about 9-11, I realized that the geopolitical realm was the most important thing for me to focus my writing on. And I, I continued to write for the New American, but... Um, about three years ago, I just started to blog independently. I started my own website. I did have a website before that, but when I had cancer, so it was taken down by criminal activity. We won't get into that. But oh no, uh, yeah. no, we should. But go ahead, go on. Uh, well, it was actually <laughs> it was it was a money takedown. It wasn't really a uh, um, a political takedown. But um, I uh, I've been blogging, tweeting. I got into Twitter a, a couple of years ago. And uh, I did write the script for Free Mind Films' newest uh, documentary called Shattering, which is a primer on the New World Order. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, covers false flags and CFR, uh, the uh, Federal Reserve and media control. And but my, my latest book is called Truth is a Lonely Warrior. That's the one I promote the most. And it is uh, really updates the shadows of power, which was a hundred thousand seller it still is a. Uh, a good seller and uh, the truth is a little aware which I think Rob has a copy of it is a primer A to Z primer on the new world order I start out the first chapters on false flags that have brought us into war starting with the sinking of the main and uh, up to you know the uh, non-existent weapons of mass destruction in Iraq then I go into I say well why do we have this 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 pattern of events why does our we keep getting into these wars on false pretexts because we've got the same oligarchy running the country. So I get into the Council on Foreign Relations, which is the subject of the Shadows of Power. Then chapter three, I follow the money. I say, who's behind these guys? And I look at the banksters in the Federal Reserve. And then I have chapters. We won't go over all the chapters here, but I've got chapters on media control, on uh, environmentalism, how it's used as a tool to control, on Freemasonry about the broader organizations, the internationalist organizations that keep this all in interconnected, like the Bilderbergers and the Trilateral Commission. Mm -hmm. And I've got a, a full chapter on the Vietnam War, a full chapter on 9-11. I've got a chapter on vaccines, which uh, I, I consider a tool of, of population control, a, a full chapter on weather control. And so it's pretty much A to Z on the New World Order to give to a skeptic. It's footnoted. It's indexed. Yeah, it's and, excellent. Uh, yeah, it's I excellent. wanted to get, yeah. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I wanted to give people uh, something that would be more than just one piece of the puzzle, uh, like 9-11, because they really need to see the full picture if they're going to grasp what's going on in our world. Okay, I'd like to jump in just a quick here. I'm going to back up just a little bit, because I know no, what I you mean about... No, I haven't talked enough. I haven't talked enough yet, Rob. Please, <laughs> give me a little more time. I'm just joking. Go ahead. No, <laughs> I, I know what you mean about Rachel. I mean, when I first met her, I, I was surprised that she answered my, you know, my inquiry and I'm kind of going oh no she's one of these attractive Russian spies or something so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. but yeah, anyway I, Russian spies in them by the way or at least Serbian spies and killers and stuff like that so it's very exciting <laughs> right so just watch for that hat pin or whatever anyway <laughs> I want to kind of back up to you know you were uh, making the rounds you were very popular George Bush you know who I just was always had trouble with you know and he had this oh he's a good christian man and so when you were talking evolution versus uh you know creationism uh you were the darling of this you know this uh religious right and then but apparently they were a little bit uncomfortable with you uh you know right after 9 11 happened because uh was it just that the full whole focus switched over to 9 11 and nobody was you know, I've heard other people say that once 9-11 happened, all the Christian stuff kind of went to the back burner for a while. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Or? Well, it did for a lot of uh, people, although it's still just as relevant. But part of the problem is, and actually I did a show just yesterday on Trad Cat and Night on Christian Zionism. Part of the problem with 9-11 in communicating to Christians is that the Christian community doesn't know that it has really been taken over. And I'm talking about the the um, 
the fundamentalist side of the Protestant churches. Uh, they have been taken over uh, through the back door by the Rothschilds through front groups, through a front bi reference Bible called the Schofield Reference Bible, which goes back a century now. But they have been taught to believe that Israel is the modern recreation of biblical Israel. It is not. It is a creation of the of the Rothschilds. It, they were the, the Balfour Declaration, which got was which was used to blackmail Britain into creating a Palestinian state, uh, which eventually became after World War II the, uh, the state of Israel was actually uh, issued to Lord Walter Rothschild. The, the Rothschilds bought up all kinds of land in Palestine and. The Rothschilds built the Israeli Supreme Court, which you've ever seen pictures of it. It's got a Masonic uh, pyramid on the top, and it's got the Rothschilds portraits on the inside. And the, the Rothschilds, uh, it'd be fair to say that Israel is their proxy state. They are the main force behind 9-11. And uh, so when you talk 9-11 and you talk about Israel, a lot of Christians are going to be taken aback because they've been taught to think that Israel is our friend that they are the allies of the Christians, which they do not view themselves as. You're going to get us in trouble right here on our second episode, <laughs> you know, but but that's okay. It's, We're here to explore new ideas and that. And I know uh, during our test run here on Tuesday, I I had said, you know, you you seem to have a a little bit of a you know I don't know what you call it romanticism or favoritism to the old kings and the the noble class, uh, you know, the monarchies <laughs> that uh, you're really you know, getting me in trouble now. <laughs> no, <laughs> we're really I, gonna I go. Busted. Could I bust it on that? Oh, yes, when I please. Met, when I met with him at his house, after I invited myself to his house, one of the very first things I picked up on, I said, well, how is somebody supposed to vote if you're if if people are thinking like how you're thinking, James? And he goes, well, I I really think that he's, he told me that about how he appreciated the monarchy. And I was like, "What? You got to be kidding me!" And it blew that blew me away. So now I want to hear him talk about it with you because I asked that exact same question. Okay. Well, uh, here's the lowdown in a way that I think that people who aren't really apprised of it can understand. The Rothschilds, we know, are the center of this new world order, and uh, the banksters. You don't even have to say Rothschilds, but the the banksters knew that. The world's countries were run by monarchs. So you had, you know, the the czars ran Russia and the emperors ran China, and uh, they they both disappeared within six months, six years of each other in the early 20th century. And of course, every country in England uh, had a king, and of course, the king of France was the first to go. But the Rothschilds and the of the banks just knew that they could not take over a country run by a king because they couldn't get to the bloodline of that king, unless they were lucky enough to maybe intermarry, but that usually didn't happen. So they had to uh, finance revolutions, which they did usually through their proxies, the Freemasons. And uh, th they knew that if they got rid of the kings that uh, and turned a nation into a democracy, it would be easy to control because with their financial power and their control of the press, all they needed was 51% of the vote. And when you run the press, it's easy to get your guy to get 51% of the vote. So I know that here in America, we're in school to hate hate monarchs, but to tell you the truth, King George III wasn't that bad. The only tax being levied on Americans in, by the year 1773 was a customs duty on tea of three, three pennies per pound. And we've been thought that we were enslaved by the British and so forth, but this is, this is a long story, but I'll just add one more thing on this, that I, if you go to my, my website, jamesperloff.com, I've got an extensive post on the Battle of Lexington of 1775. Now, I happen to grow up in Lexington, and I walk past that famous battle green every day, and I'll tell you right now that that Battle of Lexington was a false flag. It was orchestrated. The British were uh, put in a position to fire first. They wanted a massacre. That's why you have all these uh, colonial ca uh, casualties at Lexington, and only one minor British casualty. Uh, at the Battle of Lexington. They wanted to get that war going. It was a Freemasonic event, and that's why the Freemasons have their headquarters for their north, northern jurisdiction in Lexington, Mass. right now. Uh, but that's uh, not something that's to be uh, good news uh, to the ears of a lot of American patriots, of which I am one, by the way, and I count American patriots among my best friends, and many of my PowerPoints have been given to American patriotic organizations. But I will say that, frankly, getting rid of Marx and that included the American Revolution, was uh, part and parcel of the long-term, long-term New World Order plan. 
I'm mm -hmm. going to jump in real quick right here because I want to comment on our chat room. We appreciate everybody showing up and listening live. And we've got, uh, well, first of all, we got people asking for merchandise, T-shirts and coffee mugs and the like. There, <laughs> oh, Rachel. <gosh. laughs> and uh, next we right. have, uh, someone is asking, James, do you have any audio books of your work? Or would you like um, to no, have? But, uh, Rachel has uh, taken initiative on making her books into audio, but I, I, yeah. I appreciate that. I have never taken the time to uh, create an audio edition. It's certainly something that uh, I guess uh, should at least be on my yeah. back burner. Talk to me, James, after this, because I'll hook you up with somebody or a couple people. It's very easy, super easy. Okay. All right. And maybe there's even people in the audience that would, uh, you know, like to do do that. I know a lot of people, you know, are into that. And so it's, you know, we and we have some really smart people in our chat room because they've been focusing on this stuff for a long, long time. But we want to get this out to a broader audience. So I'm going to give it back to Rachel and you, okay. you continue well, great. on. With... Okay, talking, the, bringing it back to a broader audience. I wrote down two terms that I was really tripped up about in the beginning of this whole thing. What is the Council on Foreign Relations? If you can briefly tell us, James, so people can get their head around what that book that you wrote is about. Okay, in uh, 1919, uh, the World War I's aftermath was being settled at the Paris Peace Conference, and President Woodrow Wilson went there surrounded by a um, entourage of bankers uh, he, he didn't invite a single member of his party, not one Democratic congressman or senator, senator went with him. And that uh, multiple purposes there. But one of the main ones was the League of Nations, which he did not invent. But that was the first attempt at world government. But as it so happened, the founding fathers of America were wise enough to stipulate in the Constitution that no president could single handedly make a, a treaty commitment. So our entry into the League of Nations had to be ratified by the Senate, which said, no, we don't want a, any foreign uh, international body infringing on our sovereignty. So the moment the bankers in Paris heard the news that the Senate had rejected the Versailles Treaty, which created the League of Nations, they held a series of meetings. And at these meetings, they decided to form a new organization in America, which would change our, our climate of opinion here in the United States so they would accept world government. And that was incorporated two years later as the Council on Foreign Relations, which mm -hmm. professor, you, you know, Professor Carol Quigley in his mm -hmm. book, Tragedy and Hope, says it was a front group for J.P. Morgan and company. As a matter of fact, their very first president was J.P. Morgan's personal attorney, uh, John W. Davis. Their very mm -hmm. first vice president was Paul Cravath, attorney for J.P. Morgan and company. And their very first chairman was Russell Luffingwell, uh, who was senior partner, uh, a partner in uh J.P. Morgan and Company. And then the Rockefellers brought their people in. And David Rockefeller was the chairman for many years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, his pre predecessor in that position was John J. McCloy, who, like Rockefeller, was chairman of the Chase, Rockefeller's Chase National Bank. And David Rockefeller is still the honorary chairman of the Council on Foreign Relations. And um, his, by the way, his, his maternal grandfather was the uh, the guy who introduced the original Federal Reserve legislation, Senator Nelson Eldridge, to see how it all connects together. Now, right. now, I've told you about people, but the second part of your question, uh, Rachel, is what is the council? The council is uh, is supposed to be uh, an elite foreign policy discussion group, but right. in reality, it serves as the supplier of cabinet level personnel to Washington. And just to back that up with numbers, um, well, you know what? I don't have a count that includes the Trump administration, which is more Zionist than CFR oriented. CFR is short for Council on Foreign Relations. But through the Obama administration, we've had 19 secretaries of state, 21 treasury secretaries, 23 defense and war secretaries and 16 CIA directors that have been drawn for the roster of count the Council on Foreign Relations. They are globalist minded. And uh, it's because our cabinets are chosen uh, so consistently over the years, whether it was a George Bush, who got people like Colin Powell uh, from the, the CFR and Dick Cheney, or whether it was Bill Clinton who drew 12 cabinet members from the CFR. This is one reason why our policies have changed so little from one administration to another, right. well, with the Democrat or Republican, because they're getting, getting their people from the same body, same the same pool. elitist yeah. group. Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't care if uh, Dick Cheney is a Democrat and George, so uh, I'm sorry, Dick Cheney is a Republican and George Soros is a Republican. They still represent the Wall Street banker elite. 
and right. uh, the, not not the people of America. But the Council on Foreign Relations is a globalist organization that's almost 100 years old. Uh, that is the chief supplier of cabinet level and sub cabinet level personnel to Washington. And then they they kind of do window dressing with people like Angela, Angelina Jolie and these other celebrities. Right. And they, they 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 made their own website. First, they were like very secretive. They couldn't even walk into their building. And now they've got a website and they put out newsletters for everybody to see what they they think they want to do. Um, I think that's interesting. The other thing that I found hard to get around was Masonic. What is what do Masons have to do with all of this? Well, it's always been important for um, secrecy and obedience uh, to be a part of this New World Order plan. And so if you look historically at, um, hate to say it, the American Revolution, everybody on Paul Revere's ride was a Freemason, including the guy mm-hmm. who sent him on it and the guy who he was bringing the message to, John Hancock, all members of the same lodge. We won't go there. But if you look at all the European revolutions, the French Revolution, the Mazzini Italian Revolution, the Portugal Revolution of 1910, and even the Young Turk Revolution that overthrew the Sultan, all of these uh, were done through the um, Freemasons. You know, uh, before the French Revolution, there were 2,000 Masonic lodges, each with its own revolutionary committee. And when they had the uh, fr- the original assembly um, of delegates uh, after they overthrew the king, uh, hundreds were members who were, were Freemasons. Most of them were Freemasons. And the secrecy was necessary to keep their plans from being known. The obedience was necessary for them to to carry out these missions uh, reliably. Now, one reason, of course, that Freemasons have been willing to carry out these tasks is because they get rewards. They get promoted in the army or in business or they get a contract by fellow Freemasons and you get to go up the ladder of life because your fellow Masons uh, helped you out. By the way, this is not to denigrate the average Blue Lodge Mason in America uh, who knows nothing of the fact that at the very upper illuminated levels of Freemasonry, they actually worship Lucifer and that comes from ex-Masons. So uh, it is reliable information. But no, there, there are different types of lodges and not all of not, not all of them are into that. They've even been on alternative media radio shows run by Freemasons who are good guys. And mm-hmm, I've, mm-hmm. I've had friends who are Freemasons. It's been part and parcel. But here's something interesting that I learned from uh, uh, someone who wrote me in Europe. And he said that the reason that the Freemasons declined after World War II, you know why that was? What well, now? No. Uh, you know, up until World War II is very important. If you want to advance in politics, to be a Freemason. Of course, FDR, Franklin D. Roosevelt was a 32 degree Mason. He's the guy who put the Freemasonic pyramid on the back of the dollar right, bill. Right, right. And uh, Harry Truman was 33rd degree. But after World War II, you know what? They didn't need the Freemasons anymore. You know why? Because why? they developed the CIA and the NSA. And from now on, free secret activities could be carried out by government taxpayer funded secret organizations and that's why the freemasons declined in influence in america they didn't need them anymore uh-huh interesting so that all right how does that relate to like the skull and bones and you hear that sort of stuff going on over the really big private universities the, that's kind of the same sort of thing though right skull and bones yeah. Okay. Yeah, secret, secret societies are a labyrinth and skull and bones is one of them there's another at yale called scroll and key Right. Um, William P. Bundy, who drafted the Tonkin Gulf Resolution, was Skull and Bones, but it was his father-in-law, Dean Acheson, who also went to Yale and was Scroll and Key, who was the man who persuaded Lyndon Baines Johnson to escalate the Vietnam War. Uh, but they were both interconnected, and there are these elite, super, super secret uh, societies that go well above the regular levels of Freemasonry that are used. And we don't really know that much about them because they are so secret, but you know that when <laughs> They're uh, super George, secret, right. yeah, George Bush was uh, running for president it was, uh, against John Kerry, they were both members of Skull and Bones. Right. And they wouldn't even talk about it when the media just, uh, you know, innocently yeah, asked they them. Asked well, him, they asked yeah. him flat out on TV, on the news. And they both had, yeah. very, they're both, both very cagey about it. Yeah, they say that even Averill Harriman left the Paris peace talks on Vietnam back in the 60s because he said it was more important for him to attend the latest Skull and Bones meeting. And by the way, for people who are interested, there is a movie which is said to be about Skull and Bones. Unfortunately, the high definition version has been taken off of YouTube. 
but I think you and I think it's even hard to find a full length version of it now. But it was the Glenn Ford movie, The Brotherhood of the Bell, where he's a member of a, a secret college fraternity. And um, one of the new members says, I guess we're part of the establishment. And he says, no, we are the establishment. And in this movie, Glenn Ford has to do something so unsavory to another college professor that uh, the college professor commits suicide and Glenn Ford decides that he's going to go out on a crusade against this secret society, which they say is boy sense, skull and bones. And uh, all of a sudden his world falls apart. His father's being attacked by the government. He loses his job. He suddenly realizes that his wife was given to him by the society. All these benefits he thought that he'd won on his own were actually provided by the society. And since he doesn't serve it anymore, the, the world has suddenly turned against him. It's a great little movie, The Brother of the Bell, but uh, it was not well known at the time. It was actually a TV movie. It's one of those little movies that just kind of slipped in there, but people discovered it and found that this is really one of those few Hollywood flicks that actually tells you how the world works. Wow, time is really going by fast. And I want to squeeze in here just a little bit uh, before our bottom of the hour special report. Uh, but I want to bring it back to current times because, you know, you, you always talk about this this false left-right paradigm. And for all the time that the oil pipelines, you know, there have been protests going on continuously for the last eight years. And then, we, you know, it wasn't on the mainstream news, but it was all over the social media, the water cannons being sprayed on the people at Standing Rock. And so, what, two weeks before Obama's ready to leave office, he says, okay, we're going to stop the, the pipeline. And then wh while <laughs> this whole thing was going on with the inauguration and the Women's March on Washington, and that got all the news, but in the meantime, uh, Donald Trump, who owned stock in, along with, you know, Perry, the uh, the whatever the energy secret new energy secretary, and uh, Trump, you know, just says okay, start up the uh, the pipeline project again. You, I mean, this kind of demonstrates this false left right right in your face to me. Well, well, I, well, a lot of people are invested in that pipeline project, like a lot of them. It's not just people; it's huge companies. There, it's all interlinked. The investments in the pipeline. That's true, but I like I say it's kind of like you know you watch the uh, the left hand the uh, the women's march movement while the right hand is you know is doing something completely different. But I right uh, they do that to us all the time. All we, the time. Yeah, it's the old magician's trick. So yeah. I, I I think that's a important thing. Uh, but anyway, I and, and once again we've got people in the chat that are reading uh, War and Peace, and somebody's working on the audio book for that. So you've already got volunteers, Jim, uh, for for mm -hmm. that work if you're interested. So oh, pass that information on to me. Uh, I'm, I can't look at the chat room as you can there, Rob. But to pass the information on to me, I'd uh, be interested certainly. All right, that sounds very good. And so, Rachel, are you ready to go? I'll do our, our little... We could, unless we want to just keep chatting and do this at the end. I mean, it's up to you. I well, think it's up... We could... You want to keep talking to James? Or you want to bust in and let everybody have a mental breather with the tie color for, for a little bit? Uh, I, that was so much information for me to absorb, and I've been doing this a while, you know, but you, uh, James, you're just a wealth of... You know, you're an encyclopedia, know. so it's kind of like... And he like, has uh, more to tell us, too. Like, if you get to sit down with him, honestly, everybody... James, you should, what you should do... It, here's me telling you what to do. Open up a coffee shop and just do, like... Every every <laughs> once a week, just sit down and just talk to people over coffee, and people go nuts. I, I, I promise you, it would be awesome. There was a radio show host, you know, some years ago who had uh, a restaurant, and he would just uh, run a show right out of his restaurant. I'm sorry, I've forgotten his name. This is back in the 1990s. But, uh, yeah, uh, by the way, uh, as Rob knows, uh, women always tell us what to do. <laughs> Either that or we have a march. But, <laughs> yeah. All right, I'm gonna t I'll do the but, tie color report just to like let everybody have a mental breather for a minute. I think right. that's a great idea. Let's do the okay, tie color. Okay, should we do the intro music? We got the yes, intro music. Yes, oh, yes, right. Yes. <laughs> okay, here right. it comes. Tell me when to start. Shadow Citizen presents the Necktie Color Report. And now for this week's interpretation of the subliminal messaging in Necktie Color as shown in this week's photos distributed by the mainstream media. Welcome to this week's edition of the Shadow Citizen Tie Color Report. This past week, we witnessed the historic inauguration of the 58th President of the United States, 
Of course, that number 58 doesn't include the for forgotten presidents of the Continental Congress and the Articles of Confederation era during the 13 years before 1776 and 1779, excuse me, 1789, when the Constitution was finally signed off by all the former colonies except Rhode Island, which all the other states ganged up on and did trade embargo slash boycott until Rhode Islanders were starving to death. And finally, Rhode Island acquiesced and signed the thing. And that's why I think it's really interesting that they featured a love letter written by a Rhode Island volunteer during the American Revolution, where the guy was proclaiming in verbiage way above the common reading level these days, how much freedom meant, and that he would die to preserve this cherished freedom. It also explains the colonial flags as a backdrop during swearing in of Donald J. Trump, who was sporting, as expected, his red power tie. Interestingly, the New York Post and the Daily News were running almost the exact same cover for their papers, with Trump wearing a lively blue tie on Inauguration Day. By the way, that image which greeted people that morning was from a family photo shoot set up by the president's daughter, Ivanka, where all of the family members were wearing gray, and the blue tie was prominently featured as they stood in front of the imposing statue of Abraham Lincoln inside the Lincoln Memorial. Blue represents the traditional color of the Democratic Party in the United States, and the state of New York typically votes Democrat. Basically, those covers were in place to calm the New York audience down. Also, if the right shade of blue, that blue can represent support of Israel. The physiology of blue is calming. The psycho psychological impact is one that represents intelligence. But back to the high production value of the inauguration. Donald Trump was, of course, the star of the show, and his wife, Melania, was wearing a fabulous updated Jackie O-inspired toned-down Robin's Egg blue dress with matching leather gloves. The ex exiting President Obama was wearing a blue tie, and his wife, Michelle, was wearing a toned-down earthy red wool dress. The syncopation of red and blue, brilliant red and blue, and the yin and yang principle of the woman-man dichotomy created balance, and this was clearly drawn. It was so well drawn that I suspected that the outfits were coordinated or at least approved by a Hunger Games type special event planner, further strengthening my belief that both couples handlers were in touch with someone who was coordinating the presidential outfits was the obvious use of white and Trump's female family members and Trump's female campaign adversary, Hillary Clinton, who is wearing a custom-made Ralph Lauren white pantsuit. White represents purity. In this case, it also completes the red, white, and blue American flag theme that all the critical players were participating in. Meanwhile, Hillary Clinton's husband could be seen wearing her signature color since her concession speech, at which they were both conspicuously featuring purple. At the inauguration on January 20th, Bill Clinton was wearing a purple tie, with teeny tiny little American flags on it. I was not surprised to see purple at the inauguration in the audience and on the choir. This visually showed support of Hillary Clinton and by extension, the new and upcoming version of democracy in America, where both of the best of the best of both parties would bleed together, a coming together of the people. Now I'm not saying this is what is going on right now. I'm saying this is where they want to mentally take you. The strength of the aggressive red, long held by the Republicans, and the intellect of the blue, cherished by the Democrats. I wrote a blog post about this purple phenomenon called America the Purple. It's over at my website if you want to read it. But you should know that purple is the blending of two primary colors, red and blue. And your body recognizes this visual stimulus either by mentally bowing down in awe of the majesty, majesty of this color or by being so thrilled with this combination, your brain exhibits a more playful pattern of thought once exposed to the color. It's no secret that purple is a universal favorite with children. Moving beyond the inauguration, President Trump appeared signing his first presidential memoranda regarding the national transition away from Obamacare in his red power tie. Then the next day, Trump made his first official appearance at the CIA, where he delivered a speech not so co covertly warning the CIA that he will be rebuilding the organization without a fifth column, which means he will be getting rid of secret sympathizers of, of external forces that are embedded within the organization 
who carry out acts of sabotage, disinformation, or espionage. He was wearing a darkish blue with white horizontal stripes, a necktie for that speech, which was perfect. The blue showed intelligence and the interruption of it in regular pattern of interference by purity or nothingness. Not surprisingly, Trump's White House press secretary, Sean Spicer, who was coincidentally from Rhode Island, began his career defending the president's recollections of the inaugural crowd while wearing a wonderful red tie composed of blue X's encircled by white O's, which made a rich woven pattern. However, the opulent pattern was gone immediately after Trump's CIA speech, where Spicer could be seen wearing almost the exact same tie as Trump when he began briefings about voter fraud and how Trump would be pushing for further investigation. Hence the blue with the white horizontal stripes communication to intelligence and slashes of purity. Whether these Thai messages are true or just for effect, I think they are working in a positive direction so far, but I'll keep you posted during next week's Shadow Citizen Thai Color Report. Okay, thank you, Rachel. That was excellent. Uh, and so now we're back to, man, this uh, heavy history lesson. And do we want to, you know, let, uh, you know, James just keep going or should we, you know, try yeah. to look at some of the uh, the current events or, or is there anything going on currently that you want to talk about, James? Well, we could certainly pick up from what Rachel was saying about Donald Trump. I think that's something that most people are interested in right now is, um, is, uh, is his, um, presidency going to be as authentic as we've hoped it to be or will it move in other directions and uh, looking at him so far I see uh, a lot of positives I, sh I should just start out I guess by saying that uh, like many people in alt media I felt that it was a matter of stop Hillary at all costs and the media was arrayed against her and I even made a meme out of uh, David and Goliath, with Goliath as the mainstream media and David as the alt media, and I do regard the past uh, election as a victory for populism and for alt media because, as you guys know, the election they wanted was to uh, to keep the Bush Clinton crime families in. That they wanted Jeb Bush as the Republican and they wanted Hillary as the Democratic candidate. And when Jeb Bush turned out to be an Edsel, which uh, I don't know. <laughs> If, uh, okay, uh, Rachel does know what that is. I know she's younger. I didn't know she'd know that, like you and I know, Rob, what, what an Edsel is. But yeah, it was an Edsel, had, he dropped out. Um, go ahead, Rob. Uh, I, I had some friends who actually had an Edsel station wagon painted, you know, as a hippie uh, car. They had the American <laughs> flag all over it and peace signs and everything when I was in high school. So that was the uh, the girls' car to go back and forth to school. And I think it drove their folks kind of nuts. But it was really a, a pretty classy car. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, I'm I'm right with you there too. I have to confess, I didn't vote for either of the lesser of two evils, but I was so glad that Hillary didn't get it because, uh, and I don't know if there was. I think there was probably voter fraud on both sides or election frauds on on both sides, but uh, you know we'll see what happens. Now, but, I, I mean, don't know. Uh, here, here's here's what I, my thought. I kind of disagree with uh, James. I think that Trump is part of the game. I, I think that he was sent into the election to just, I, I think he, it didn't matter if he or Hillary won. And well, it just he, came down to like a marketing campaign. And I think what it really came down to is where these, both of the candidates stood with Israel because Netanyahu came and he met with both of them right before one of their final debates. And I think when um, Trump said he would make Jerusalem the capital, to Netanyahu at that time. I think that's what kind of sealed the deal. And I, I that's, and me, I ended up, and I'll just say it, I ended up, um, because I was really, really conflicted by this. I didn't even know if I was going to vote at all. And it's not because of the Israel thing. It's not because of anything. I really just felt like the media and the way this, ele the whole presidential campaign had been run, I really felt like they were really hurting us into boxes. And we had to just hunker down to make a choice between evil or less evil or but evil is evil and i i didn't consent so i went and i voted i voted for all the um local questions the state questions the local politicians and when it came to president i just wrote in i do not consent and rhode island counts right in votes and so i voted i do not consent 
Well, a couple of the positive things that I've seen so far, and I know it's kind of playing into the populism, but, you know, he didn't cancel Obamacare, but he did uh, apparently sign a, you know, whatever that... A memorandum. Yeah, a memorandum, yeah. That uh, people wouldn't be fined if they didn't have Obamacare. So that's going to be that's gonna be a big sigh of relief to a lot of people. I'm also very uh, happy that he didn't do anything with the TPP. And then the other thing, you know, he hasn't really said anything about the wall since coming in. And, and I uh, I think the wall is just uh, is a mistake. But then that's just me. So no, I think they're starting the wall. I think he's talking to people today about that, Rob. OK, I, I, I just heard in the last day or two that he hadn't said anything yet. So that might be hmm. on the agenda today. He is. You know, this is his first week. Yeah, so. he's moving quick, though. I mean, he is moving quick. And I am hopeful that everything that he's got us involved in with all the Goldman Sachs stuff. Um, I, I'm hopeful. I am hope. I do have to say I am hopeful. Well, the whole, you know, this whole financial bubble that's got to burst at some point or another, you know, we've got the the largest bond bubble in history and then mm -hmm. nobody talks about the derivative bubble. So I won't even go there. That's a whole different show. And maybe in the future, that's something that Catherine Austin fits one of our upcoming yeah, she guests. Can tell us about that. That's and like, that will be excellent. Mm -hmm. So James, back to you, whatever you want to go on. <laughs> well, I uh, was just uh, going to segue into uh, after a moment to what Rachel was saying about Israel and she's quite right about Netanyahu visiting both. But, I do think there's a difference there in his um, in his opposition to TPP. He um, his uh, willingness to work with Putin. I understand that he has um, spoken to Robert F. Kennedy about uh, being on a vaccine task force. If that actually is uh, created, that would be great news. I don't think he's going to push transgender on us like Obama did. And um, of course, he is uh, very much. Um, uh, taken on the mainstream media, which prior to these debates between him and Clinton, I never even heard a candidate use the phrase mainstream media. So I think there's positives in there and he deserves time. Now, having said that, I also think that uh, what Rachel said about Israel is uh, extremely important. If you go back uh, more than a year, if you guys follow Brother Nathaniel, who is a um, very popular YouTuber. I follow him. He's a uh, Jewish convert to Christianity and a great political observer. He had a, a video come out more than a year ago called Trump's Deck of Jewish Cards. And he goes way back in the history of the Trump family, the connection to Ro the powerful lawyer Roy Icahn. And he warned about Jared Kushner in that in there about how uh, Trump's daughter had converted to Judaism to, to marry him. And also he talked about Trump's IOUs to Carl Icahn, the Jewish a bankster who's um, always a, 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 a corporate raider and he bailed out Trump when Trump went bankrupt with his entertainment and he's got a funny conversation in there between Icon and Trump where uh, he uh, Icon cancels the debt but he wants, wants things from Trump and so Trump you know is the only guy to make a campaign commercial for Israeli television for Benjamin Netanyahu uh, which is significant especially when you consider that he has just invited Netanyahu to the White House for next week. And um, uh, also looking at this, you see that he's made uh, the two men that Brother Nathaniel warned us about more than a year ago, Carl Icahn and Jared Kushner, are now senior advisors to the president. Yes. And I just Tell saw us this. more about senior advisors. You, t you were telling me about this the other day, who these people are. These well, <laughs> It's I get, amazing. Like, who are these people? These are the people that are really like running the show. I, I get worried, uh, you know, sometimes it's not the cabinet officials who are there more for show, but the people who are sub cabinet and the people who are advisors. If you go back to Woodrow Wilson, the guy who gave us the Federal Reserve, he, he had a guy living right in the White House as his top advisor. No official cabinet position it was Edward Mandel House, and he was fronting for Wall Street and Bernard Baruch. And the exact same thing with Franklin D. Roosevelt. He had a man living in the White House, Harry Hopkins, front man for Bernard Baruch, and he was an unofficial advisor. And one of the things I write about when I write about Pearl Harbor is uh, the fact that uh, he and Baruch were getting copies of the, those decoded Japanese intercepts, which our commanders in Hawaii weren't even getting. That's how uh, how high these guys are, but they have no official position. And I, I don't like the idea of these unofficial advisors surrounding the president. But I just read that the um, top assistant to 
uh, 35-year-old Jared Kushner is going to be. Abraham Berkowitz, whose cousin, first cousin, is former president of APAC, the um, the Jewish mm-hmm. lobbying organization. And something that was really worrying about the inauguration to me, uh, Rachel, and you were just talking about the, the inauguration, was that he was introduced by the uh, Jewish senator from New York, uh, Schumer, the, the last man to speak before right. the inaugural address. And then afterwards, uh, the first comments were made were the invocation by a Orthodox rabbi, uh, Rabbi uh, Heyer, who is the founder of the uh, Simon Wiesenthal Center. And he did not speak about America or Trump. He simply spoke about Zion and Jerusalem, quoting from the Bible. And uh, that was quite troubling. There's never been a, a Orthodox Jew given invocation before. The fact that um, his, he was sandwiched between two Jewish individuals, and I'm half Jewish myself, I'm not anti-Semitic in the least, I'm concerned about the fact that he says he's going to move that uh, U.S. embassy to Jerusalem. If you look into the history of Zionism and the desire to rebuild, tear down the mosque at uh, the t- Temple Mount and build a, uh, a, uh, a new Jewish temple there, which if you read the Bible and you read the prophecy there, it's not a, 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 a temple for Christ as so many uh, dispensational Christians believe it's going to be a temple for the Antichrist, the temple for the leader of this whole new world order. And that, when you put it all together, uh, is a very frightening aspect to, to uh, Donald Trump, especially also, I'll add one more thing, he's getting together a cabinet that doesn't look CFR to me, it looks Zionist, he's surrounded right. by Zionists. Uh, uh, his, uh, Michael Glasner uh, as deputy campaign man- manager and his um, his uh, David Friedman, his ambassador to Israel, is a hardcore pro-settler. Mike Pence is very Zionist. Michael Flynn. Um, you just go down the list, and he's got generals in there. He's got uh, Mad Dog Mattis as, uh, at defense. He's got um, uh, General Kelly at Homeland Security. He's got General Flynn at NASA Security. It looks like a war cabinet is what he's assembling, and I am concerned with Netanyahu coming next week. They were not. I, I, I'm, what I'm concerned about is this: that they've kind of said, "Okay, you guys wouldn't take the soft approach to a world government. You've turned down the TPP. You've resisted that. You've resisted turning the NAFTA into a Euro, uh, American North American Union and the mold of the European Union. You turned down the soft approach. So we're going to go hard on you. We're going to bring about another 9/11 false flag, and you're going to go to war with Iran, and you're going to go to war with Iran on on Israel's side. That's what I." am concerned about, especially when I take a look at the Rothschilds uh, owned magazine, The Economist, and their world of 2017 cover, which has a, a t- set of tarot cards with a death card with a nuclear bomb exploding. I'm very concerned. That we <laughs> I, 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 um, no, no, no. The, that spread that night, the very night that that came out, I got my, got the resources out about the tarot cards, mm-hmm. and it turns out that that's actually according to The Economist, a very good spread that they oh, had laid out for us. Nukes yeah. are good. No, yeah, well, the whole entire thing was very, very interesting. Um, I should do some sort of report on that. Somebody, the people that were on my Facebook page saw that I outlined how that went, and it was interesting. I'm very con- interested about who does the artwork for the magazine The Economist, because somebody, somebody just didn't, like, let the graphic designer go, okay, just put these cards on our cover and just yeah, have fun with that. Mm-hmm. No, they, they have, were on purpose. So well, I want to I, I throw out something here if I just can. We're running out of time. This is going so fast. No, it's so no, crazy. No, no, no. <laughs> and so first of all, yeah, my concern of the uh, dual citizenship, the Israeli and U.S. citizens, I mean, that's one huge thing. I want to say right off, you know, that I, I, you know, I've been really ignorant of all this stuff all of my life. And so when I met Kevin Barrett, I knew nothing about Islam before I met Barrett. And then I read his books and I've talked with him several times. And, you know, I got a, a new understanding of Islam. Now, I think that there are perfectly crazy, you know, people that are Muslims, but I also think we have crazy people that are Christians that are also Judas, Judaism. Or, yeah, I don't know, maybe there aren't as many crazy Buddhists out there, but I think all of the religions have this crazy uh, gene in them. And, and I guess the other thing I might want to throw out is just that what, there's speculation that Kennedy, uh, you know, may have been assassinated for trying to keep Israel from getting the nuclear bombs. Can you talk about any of those, James? 
I can. In fact, I have an article which deals with that. It's the next to the last article on my blog. It's called uh, um, To 9-11 and Beyond, the Rothschild-Israeli Obsession with Nuclear Weapons. And it goes into the fact that Ben-Gurion resigned in 1963, right after Kennedy had American planes fly over the Demona plant where they were building nukes. And even Wikipedia says that Ben-Gurion was obsessed, that's their phrase, with developing nuclear weapons. You know, Israel started its nuclear weapons program in 1949. They founded Israel in 1948. That's pretty quick to start a nukes program going. And um, there was a book that came out by um, Michael Collins Piper that tied Kennedy's assassination to his opposition to, nu to the nuclear weapons program in Israel. I didn't pay a lot of attention to that until Mordecai Venunu, the Israeli whistleblower was finally released from prison and he said wait till you find out that Kennedy was assassinated for that and that gave a lot of validity to that book but if you go into that uh, article of mine not only do I talk about the potential links between Kennedy's assassination and uh, Israel's nuclear weapons program but the possibility that 9-11 itself was a nuclear event and I'm talking about two suitcase nukes in the basements of elevator 50 uh, that uh, when you start to put it together with his dancing Israelis and Benjamin Notnew being such good friends with Larry Silverstein, they would call him every week, according to the Israeli newspaper Haaretz. And Larry, as the brand new owner of the World Trade Center for less than two months, would have been just the man to give Israeli agents access to the basements of the uh, World Trade Center, which, by the way, Benjamin Netanyahu, two days after 9-11, told Tom Brokaw, I've got the clip there on my my web article, he bragged to him, he said, I warned you that if you didn't, um, let me see if I got the exact quote um, from Netanyahu. Okay, Netanyahu, quote, in 1995, wrote a book called Fighting Terrorism, and I said that if we don't arrest the tide of militant Islamic terrorism, then the next thing will be is not a car bomb on the World Trade Center, but a nuclear bomb. Uh, and then he corrects himself, says, well, as he said to Martin, he says, no, it wasn't a nuclear bomb, it was a 350-ton conventional bomb, unquote. Benjamin Netanyahu, well, how does he know the yield of the bomb, and why does he know it's a bomb and not planes that brought down the World Trade Center? And it, I bought that book, by the way, and he said it would be put in the basement of the World Trade Center, the perfect place to put mm. two suitcase nukes. Oh, my God. Well, wow. We're, oh, we're, okay. I, I'm, I'm, so, I'm flabbergasted because I'm looking at the time and we could literally go on and on and on with this. This is incredible. James um, is definitely going to be a returning guest probably often. Yeah, he's going to be here again for sure. <laughs> um, but I do want to make it clear that, that, well, I personally, and I know that James is, and I know that Rob is too, we're all pro-America, okay? We're pro that we can live here and have this conversation. We are not anti-Jew. I don't have any, I, like, I'm, I'm part Jewish myself, like James. I'm part Jewish myself. All my friends growing up were Jewish, and I've been to temple a few times, seeing, you know, bar mitzvahs and everything else. It's not anti-Jew what we're concerned about. We're concerned that there's another country through these strange organizations and strange uh, clubs that seems to be taking over the United States. And that's why we're having this conversation. I'm happy to have this conversation. I wish we could go on and on and on. Um, go ahead, Rob. What do you want well, to say? Well, I just wanted to say, I think we touched on this briefly, that there's this this letter, you know, from Albert Pike or to Albert Pike. I can't remember exactly which. Maybe Jim can. But it talks about three world wars and how the third world war would be between the Christians and the Muslims. And then, you know... Uh, uh, and then the Jews would be able to to rule the earth afterwards, you know. Uh, so, I mean, this is, these things have been going on for a long, long time. There's a game plan behind the scenes, and they try to distract us, you know, and have us dumbed down to these, you know, uh, real short attention spans. I mean, just look at television. It's interrupted every 10 minutes with uh, stuff. And so people just can't look at the big picture. And I think that's what we want to do. We're not pro or con any one race, religion, or anything. I'm certainly not anti-Semitic. Uh, I've had just as many, I've had more lousy bosses that were good American, you know, Christians than I've had uh, Jewish bosses. So, but anyway, James, yeah, uh, please plug your website, your books, and your and a movie that you you wrote the 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 screen, uh, screenplay oh my gosh, for. Yeah, right. we're gonna we're actually gonna have the uh, producer of your movie next week. Chris Emery will be on our show next week. 
Um, right. And uh, how much time do we actually have left, guys, before we cut off? Uh, oh, two minutes, not even. Yeah, two minutes. Oh, okay. All right. Um, well, my uh, website is jamesproloff.com. And uh, as I mentioned, my latest book is Truth is a Lonely Warrior, which is a primer on the New World Order. And I am on Twitter, and I do blog regularly. And uh, look forward to uh, connecting up. You can contact me through my website. Look forward to connecting with your listeners. Yeah, and buy his book. Buy, which one do you want him to buy? Truth is a Lonely Warrior is probably the better one, right, for everybody? It's the most up-to-date book. Yeah, and I'd get that, that That's the one I just read, and it covers so much territory. And it, there's it's lots awesome. of ample footnotes in there for anybody who wants to dig deeper to, you know, to look at mm -hmm. other stuff. But, yeah, I'm looking forward to reading some of your other books, uh, James. I've listened to you for years, and, you know, on... I've been, you know, kind of consuming all this stuff. I, I keep the, mm -hmm. the radio running right. in the background. But, yeah, thanks for uh, being on with us. And Yeah, thanks, James. This is awesome. I'm so glad you came on. Yeah, this well, is so great. Well, you guys Thank were a you. lot of fun, a lot of fun to, to work with you guys. Oh, great. No, I'm, glad. I'm glad you enjoyed it. We enjoyed it. We're definitely going to have you back on because there's so many different things we have to talk to you about. Absolutely. I've enjoyed this immensely. And I guess uh, I, I chose the, the ending music here, which is by the police. And I, I keep remembering uh, Gorbachev, you know, saying, yes, the Russians do love their children, too. But that's not the song that we're going to play. I think that we are all still spirits in this material world. And so we will go out with that. And uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We'll be back next Wednesday with Chris Emery. And uh, same bat time, same bat channel. And, uh, yeah, we're going to just continue <laughs> growing and getting better. So thanks again, James. Thank you, Rachel. And here Thank is you. the police with uh, Spirits in Material World. Right on.